Nairobi Chapel, good morning. Bona Sifiwe. Delighted to see you this morning and uh, delighted to have the opportunity to share from this important book of Genesis. And we'll be spending the next six weeks together in the book of Genesis. We have appropriately titled this series, In the Beginning. In the Beginning. Why do we find it important to talk about beginnings? And why is Genesis so important? You know, beginnings are important because if you want to find out what's wrong with the present, you often have to go back to the beginning. This is what happens sometimes in your relationships. You know, you can't understand this guy, you can't understand this girl. And you go to the counselor, and what does the counselor say? Tell me about your childhood. They want to go back to the beginning so that they can understand how you're behaving and what are the issues today. The beginning of the Bible is important. It's in Genesis that we find out how it all began. We find out how we began. We found out, find out how this world began. We find out how the universe we began. And we find out about the God who began it all. Do you know Genesis is a book that is foundational to the rest of Scripture. It is foundational to the rest of our faith and to much of our lives. Do you know it's in Genesis that we answer the big, we find the answers to the big questions of life. Where did I come from? Who am I? What is my purpose? We find these questions answered in Genesis. Do you know something? Genesis is where we find God's first 10 commandments. Now, some of you are looking at me and thinking that I got my books mixed up. You think the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus? Well, those are actually the second Ten Commandments. In Genesis, God says ten times, let there be and there was. Let there be and there was. Each and every one of those commands given to nature was fully obeyed. In Exodus, the time he gives the second Ten Commandments, each and every one of those Ten Commandments given to man was fully disobeyed. What is it about man that we cannot obey God's commands, but nature fully obeys God's commands? Well, Genesis tells us the answer, because it is in Genesis that we understand what went wrong with the world. It's in Genesis we understand how evil came into the world, how our enemy came into the world. We understand his purpose, and we know why he's at enmity with God. Do you know it is the book of Genesis that is quoted most in the New Testament after the book of Isaiah? Jesus himself looked back to Genesis when he was asked some tough questions. He was asked a tough question about marriage. And what does he say? Have you not read that in the beginning? He goes back to Genesis to give him the basis for marriage. The Apostle Paul, in that great chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, on the resurrection, refers back to Adam, and he's talking about Christ's resurrection, and he says Christ has indeed been raised, and he says, as in Adam, so he's basing the resurrection argument back on the book of, of, of Genesis, as in Adam, all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. This character, Adam, who is our common ancestor, Jesus himself, do you know? is actually referred to as the last Adam in that same passage. The first Adam, Paul says, brought death. The second Adam, Christ, brought life. Each and every one of us has to decide where and which one of those two Adams we are going to come under. If you are born naturally and only naturally, you come under the line of Adam, and that leads to death. If you're born again, you're born spiritually under the last Adam, and that is Jesus Christ and that leads to life. And finally, and importantly, they say that in order to move forward best, you need first to look back. If we are to look forward, and look forward not only in the present, but into the distant future, into eternity, and want to understand where our eternity is, do you know what? The best answers are found in Genesis. It is in Genesis 1 and 2 where we find 
paradise. God's perfect intention and plan, not only for you and I, but for his universe, restored. Pa um, sin enters, sin destroyed. Everything else in between those two mirror images is God's redemption plan for you and I. So Genesis, my friends, is a book that is of supreme importance, and it is the foundation of the Bible. Now let us then get into Genesis, and we're going to do our reading from Genesis, and I want us all to read from the book of Genesis, but don't open your Bibles, please, because we're going to do our reading from memory. Okay, we're all going to say from memory the first verse of the book of Genesis. And don't look in your phones, my friends. I think if you can't say that, then hey, there's a, a problem. There's an issue. So let us say it together. The first verse of the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 1. Together, in the God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let's say it again for those who are muttering and those who are not very content. Con some are you know, they're very <laughs> and they're looking at their neighbor. So let's say it together with confidence, okay? Together, go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, I want us to notice that God is introduced to us as the God who always was from the beginning. The Bible doesn't belabor the point and trying to explain how God was created. It doesn't try to give any logical um, um, uh, details or explanations. It assumes and declares emphatically that in the beginning, God. So what are we being told here? We're being told that there was a beginning and that this beginning actually had God behind it. So I want us just to understand four big points today. Number one, that God is great. God is, sorry, God is. This is about the existence of God. God is great, the greatness of God. God is good, the character of God. And God is global, the purpose of God. Those are the four points I just want us to understand. And if we are to understand that the universe had a beginning, we need to understand two things. We're told in scripture that the universe began by God's special command. The universe had a beginning. In the beginning, God created. Now, this challenges, and we're going to get into a bit of detail, all those who have assumed that the world did not have any beginning, that the world has always existed. Not only is the world um, um, created by God, but do you know something? This earth, this earth where you and I live, is specially fine-tuned and designed by God for human existence. I put up there what we call um, very good examples of God's fine-tuning, divine fine-tuning, to create a home for you and I and to make it possible for this uh, world to host us and for life to begin. The oxygen level of 21%. If that level was adjusted slightly in one direction or in another direction, it wouldn't be able for us to breathe or even the, the, the plants or the animals. Jupiter, I don't know if you know, is actually a protective shield around the Earth. There are a lot of comets, comets that come. It almost acts like a uh, a vacuum cleaner in the sky, cleaning up all these objects that would otherwise come and destroy us. The axis of the earth is tilted in a way that is so precise that if it was slightly adjusted in one direction or another direction, we would be fried by the sun or we would freeze to death. So what is it about these, these divine settings that makes it so... Um, the, the, what is it about these d d divine settings that actually show that God was behind it. Do you know these things can't actually happen by chance? These things show that there is a hand behind this beautiful creation. I want to spend some time just getting into the mind and into this inner world of science because it is the scientists who sometimes want to confuse us and want to tell us that um, the world never had a beginning. And I want to just show you 
that contrary to what many people believe, that we Christians only operate on blind faith. We close our eyes and believe. And when we open our eyes after finishing uh, praying, we say whatever we believe. In other words, it is an argument despite the evidence. Whereas these are the people here who've got science on their side, say that they have got all the facts. And I can tell you that nothing is further tr from the truth. So just allow me to give a few examples. And just say that scientists also have faith-based positions. And often, those positions are not theologically neutral. Many of them are speaking, not science, but they're speaking from their own theological, often atheistic views when they are talking. And here is a point to remember. Not all statements by scientists are statements of science. Some of them reflect their own bias. I just want to quote from one person. This is an eminent scientist whose name was um, Fred Hoyle. And he's the one who came up with a theory called the steady state theory. Now, here's what he said. That the universe has always existed. That the universe has been there. Not only has it been there, it created itself. It didn't have any maker. It created itself. And it has existed since eternity. And when he was pushed, he even came up with a further theory. He said, he was pushed about how did it begin, or how did it begin, and he said this. People from outer space came and planted some seeds in the universe, and then the universe appeared. Now, hang on a minute. Someone is trying to tell us that something came from nothing. Now, how many of you just know that uh, there's a small problem with that argument? And I'm just trying to tell you, imagine something as beautiful as a very good and very expensive car is seen outside your parking lot. You see it outside your parking lot in the morning. And you say, so whose car is this? And someone in your family comes and says, no, it's just got there. How did it happen? How did it get here? Who drove it? Who is it? No, 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 no. It's just came. It just appeared. It just popped out of the sky. You'll say, okay, haha, it's very funny. So now, jokes aside, where did this car come from? So some scientist is trying to tell us something infinitely more complicated than a car, infinitely more complex, just popped out of nowhere. But this person, a few years later, and though this being the scientific consensus, all the scientists had agreed for many years that this is the way the universe was created, at some point changed their mind. It was in 1965 that some other scientists came about and discovered that there is no such possibility. The world actually began through a process. The person who created this said this, I philosophically liked the steady state theory, and clearly I have had to give that up. And he gave it up. Now notice what he's saying. He's saying this was a philosophy. He's saying it was a hypothesis. He's saying it was a theory. He's actually saying it was an ideology. It was not science. Now, scientists, by the way, have some beef between them. And let me show you how this guy was taken on by his fellow scientists. So his steady state idea was found not to be science, but to be science fiction. And it's not me saying this. Let his fellow scientists speak. This is a quote from Arno Penzias, a former Nobel prize winner in physics. Here's what it says. The steady state theory turned out to be so ugly that people dismissed it. The easiest way to fit the observations with the least number of parameters was one in which the universe was created out of nothing in an instant and continues to expand. Now, first of all, if I'm a scientist I'm, and I'm presenting a paper, and then you come and tell me my theory is ugly, I'll say, first of all, hang on, is it to me who's ugly or my theory? You know, it's like I say, can you step outside and clarify? This person is actually saying this theory was totally bankrupt. And it's not me saying it, it is a fellow Nobel Prize winner who says this. Notice what he says, I've, I've highlighted it in yellow there, that the universe was created out of nothing. He is confirming exactly what the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God 
created. The word created there in Hebrew is the word bara, which means to make, to create out of nothing. God didn't get some tools or get some material or out of nothing. God spoke the word in the world into, into being. A scientist, a Nobel Prize winner, confirming exactly what Genesis 1, 1 says. He says something else. It continues to expand. And I'll be showing how that also has been proven to be true by other scientists. Let's move on. Leading scientists are proving that the, val the, the validity of the biblical accounts. One other quote, and this is from someone who was um, heading the NASA um, space program, and he says this. And this person, by the way, even the previous, are not Christians. They're just scientists. This person, Robert Jastrow, actually admits in his book he's an agnostic, but he's saying, I'm going where the evidence leads me. Now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. This is what he's saying. There's basically no difference between the biblical accounts and the accounts of Genesis. And you know, why should we be surprised? We as Christians believe this, that the same person, God Almighty, is the author of two books. The book of nature, which is creation, and the book of scripture, which is the Bible. If the same person wrote two books, how can they contradict if properly understood and properly un un uh, interpreted? So we've seen the false clash between these two is people who are not talking science, but are talking philosophy and ideology, even the ide uh, um, atheistic ideas. People who are not even Christians are saying, based on the evidence, we see that the book of nature and the book of scripture perfectly agree. In his words, they are the same. Now, one further quote, just to um, so show how he actually nails this. He says this, that there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work. Now, notice that those words, supernatural forces at work, is now a scientifically proven fact. Here's a scientist. Remember, this is an agnostic. So he doesn't want to use the word God. What does he say? Supernatural forces. Now, you and I have a, a language for that. What is a supernatural force? Who is he? God Almighty. I just want us to see that when people are unbiased, and even the, the best scientists, Nobel Prize winners, people who run the best you know, um, uh, um, uh, programs on astronomy in the world, are looking at the world, the universe God created, and saying what the Bible says is true. Just one final quote. Here earlier on, remember the, the other person who said that the universe was created out of nothing in an instant, and continues to expand. This is something that they found out. When they, in 1965, this gentleman who won the Nobel Prize, won it for his research and his science, which in 1965 created what was the theory that replaced the steady state theory. It was called the Big Bang, the um, um, the Big Bang Theory. Now, the Big Bang Theory says this, and that is code for science, but basically they're saying that the world did not always exist. It was created through one singular event, one singular event, by one super, super, super intelligent being. And it was created in an orderly way, with very precise fine-tuning, the way I've said, very precise fine-tuning, so the planets aren't smashing into each other, they are created, and, and it uh, continues to expand. So it started at one, one point, but it continues to expand. And the way astronomers find out the age of the Earth is they look, the further the stars are from, from where the telescope is, is how they understand how the world was made. So scientists are saying the world continued to expand. What does scripture say? Isaiah 48, indeed my hand has laid the foundations of the Earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. Isaiah 40. God stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Very poetic language. He's saying exactly through the mouth of Isaiah what the scientists are saying. Created in one event and is continuing to expand. So, I just want to 
reassure us that as we do our studies and as we look at the world around us, unfortunately, you'll find there are people who still will not accept this position. I want us to know, however, that as Christians we can be confident. We are not the ones with our eyes closed and the scientists with their eyes open. On the contrary, we have our eyes wide open. They are aligning with the biblical facts and the scientific facts for those who are not biased. Your colleges may teach your kids something different. People who are popular scientists may say something different. As we've seen, that is philosophy, not science. That is ideology, even science fiction. People from space age came and planted, uh, outer space, planted seeds in the world. Imagine, I mean, for a scientist to call a fellow scientist ugly, I mean, his theory is ugly, I mean, ouch. I mean, you must have done something serious. So let us be confident in what the word tells us. And I want us also to believe further that there is a God in heaven. And this God has revealed himself to us through nature. I finally want to quote just one final person. And this is a person who won uh, also a Nobel Prize in, in physics alongside, um, he's another co-inventor um, of, the, of the Big Bang Theory. Listen to what he says. Certainly there was something that set it all off. We call that creation. Certainly, if you are religious, I can't think of a better theory of the origin of the universe to match with Genesis. This is another agnostic speaking. There is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. What are they saying? In scientific language, they're basically saying this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, my friends, this God, this awesome God, who was there at the beginning, is the creator. The world could not just have imagined so complicated, could not just have imagined on itself, so complex, so well-fine-tuned a world, so vast and magnificent, could not have made itself. It is impossible for anything to have within itself the power to create itself. Anything must have been created by something that is outside of it, and has greater power of it in order for it to exist. And that is what this uh, 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 scripture tells us, and these scientists are confirming. I want us to believe with confidence in the truth of scripture. It is because of such things that one person wrote a book with the following title. I do not have enough faith. I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. He's basically saying this, in the face of all this evidence, you and I as Christians require so much less faith because there's so much evidence. The people who, despite this evidence, still don't believe in God have so much faith. I also do not have enough faith to be an atheist. I have enough faith to be a Christian and to believe in the God of the universe. So, in the beginning, God, God is. I want us to watch a video about the greatness of God. Let's check the screen and see this video.
Amen. What an awesome God we serve. Just before we are done with our scientists, I just want us to be people who, and uh, I know there could be scientists in the room, but let's not make science a God. Let's put science in its right place. And remember that there are many things that science cannot tell us. There are many things science cannot tell us. Science cannot tell me about beauty, cannot tell me about love or hope or happiness or values or wisdom. I know we celebrated Valentine's this week and love is still in the air. Now, how many of you are in love scientifically? <laughs> no, 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 tell me, I mean, didn't you get your roses, ladies, and uh, the, 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 the roses you got? Tell me, what, you're, you're in love, or are you not? Tell me, what is the chemical composition of your love? How do we locate it on the periodic table? I mean, science cannot describe that, but it is true. Science cannot tell me about faithfulness, or forgiveness, or freedom, or friendship. Trust or truth, that is beyond the realm of science. And science cannot tell me about meaning, about my purpose. It does not give me vision or courage it does not give me any compassion. Science cannot make me more committed. Science is simply a tool of God to understand his handiwork. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies are the work of his hand. And also the psalmist said this, majestic in the heavens are thy works, O Lord, studied, studied by all who delight in them. We are meant to study the works of God, delight in them, but not aimlessly contradict them. So God is, is. Secondly, I want us to understand that God is great. What did we see there? That God is the one who determines the numbers of the stars and calls each and every one by name. Now, here's a, a small quiz. How many stars are there? Not only in our own galaxy, but in the universe. Well, the simple answer is no one knows. It's impossible to know, but they're guesstimates. Now, let me just give you a few examples. And this is what the best scientists are saying this with, uh, are saying this with the best telescopes. They started looking and used to say millions of stars. Then they realized we've got a galaxy, our own, which we live in, it's got millions of stars. And then they changed that and said there are many, many hundreds and hundreds of millions of galaxies. And then they corrected themselves and said not only are there hundreds of millions, the telescopes were getting better, the methodology was getting better. They said there are now billions, not of stars, but of galaxies. Each galaxy has hundreds of millions, if not billions, of stars in them. So understand me, we're at billions of galaxies, and each of those billions has each of those galaxies has a billion stars. I mean, you even run out of maths and computing power. It kind of, you know, fries your brain just thinking about it. But they found out that they were wrong. The technology was getting better and even better. They started saying, we're wrong. It's not hundreds of billions of galaxies. It's one trillion. The technology got better. They said two trillion. You know what the latest estimates are? Three trillion. Not stars. Galaxies. And each of those galaxies has billions of stars. Here is a God who puts them in their place and calls each by name. That is the greatness of God. When you talk about God, we're talking about the greatness of his creation. Secondly, we're talking about the greatness of his claim. God is the one who says in Psalms 50, Every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountain and the insects and the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. Here is a God who makes some audacious claims. He claims to own everything, all the cattle. He even says in this passage that if he was hungry, he wouldn't ask you for all the cattle on the hills are mine. If you want some nyamachoma, he doesn't come to you and ask. He just slaughters one of the cows and has his fried meat. This is the God we're talking about. <laughs> Everything, even the insects, he knows them. The greatness of his claims. No other God makes such claims. 
God is great. It is his, we're talking about the greatness of his conquest. What did God conquer? He conquered everything. He conquered all the enemies. He conquered sin. He conquered death on the cross and through the resurrection. Here's a God who says in Zechariah 14, The Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. Here is a God who says, He is claiming to be God of the earth and of the universe. Like no other God, other gods we know were national gods or tribal gods. This God, Yahweh, is God of the universe. And finally, we're talking about the greatness of his call. His call is great because he's calling to everyone. He says, come unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved. This God is a God who has a missionary heart for the ends of the earth. Abraham was called and told, through you, all nations on earth will be blessed. Jesus told his disciples, go into what? All, the, to, uh, every nation, and make disciples of all nations. That word there, in fact, means all ethnos, all ethnic groups. This is a God who has a claim and who is calling everyone to come and be considered under his arms to consider his claims and be saved. This is a great God. His greatness in creation the greatness of his claims, the greatness of his conquest, and the greatness of his call. But thirdly, I want to move on to the point that God is good. God is good, and here we're talking about two things. We're talking about the goodness of his creation and the goodness of his character. First of all, the goodness of his creation. Did you see in that video, what does God say? Every time he does something, he says, God looked and it was good. God saw, and it was good. God saw, and it was good. Well, why should we be surprised? A good God can only do good work. And this is work that is good functionally, but also work that is good visually, aesthetically. It is functional. It is also beautiful. A good God does good work. But this good God does good work because his character, his essence, his inner being is good. Notice in God's creation, there is no evil. God at the end of his creation looks at everything he has done. He says, it is good. It is good. It is good. Each day, at the end of the day, he looks, it is good. On the, on the, on the sixth day, he looks at everything together. He lumps it all together and says, it is very good. Nothing evil in God's perfect creation. We'll come later to discover, discover where evil comes from, but let us not blame God for evil. It is not present in his perfect creation. The other points to remember about goodness here is that God, because of his goodness, and because he made us in his image, is our basis for morality. Here is another problem for the atheist and the person who doesn't believe in God. They have got no basis within their own ideology for morality. Here's a question I want to ask you. How do you know that a line is crooked. If I draw a crooked line and I tell you that line is crooked, how do you get that concept of crooked? It is because you know what a straight line is. You know this line is straight, so this line is crooked. If you had never seen a straight line, you would not know that this line is crooked. How do you know that something is morally wrong? It's because there is a God who is morally upright. He is the basis. He is the source of our morality. Without God, even some of the most offensive things are simply people's opinions. Now, let me give some examples. It's a bit extreme, but let me give some examples. Something extreme, like murder. We all know murder, murder is wrong, but hang on a minute. Where did you get that idea from? It's from a moral God who says everyone is valuable. Why? Because they're made in his image. Therefore, do not kill. But what if people don't have those views? and decide that you're less than someone made in God's image. This is what happened. Look at the Holocaust. Six million people, because they're considered less than perfect, that perfect race they wanted to create, six million people killed and butchered. You ask Hitler what he thought, he'll say, well, murder is wrong. That's according to you. He's not operating on your principles. 
on what basis is something as abominable as rape wrong? If someone doesn't have the same value, if there's no objective source, somebody could say, well, that's my opinion. Stronger is better. But there's something wrong with it inherently. Why? Because there's a moral standard. If you take out this moral standard, everything goes. And it's your opinion against mine. And we've got no standard for morality. The standard for morality, for that which is right, for that which is good, comes from the character of God himself. God is good. The Bible says, oh, taste and see, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When Moses was asking God if he could see his face, and God really wanted, you know, he was kind of uh, happy with what Moses has done, and he said, you know, if I show you my face, you'll die, but how can, I, how can I show you my personality and something about me? God says, okay, let's come up with this deal, and he goes and hides Moses in the cleft of the rock, and God says, I'll let um, something, I'll let my dash pass before, uh, 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 before you. What is it? He didn't say, I'll let my might or my power or my justice. What did God say? I'll let all my goodness pass through you. The one thing God wanted Moses to understand is that this God who you speak to face to face is good. I want us to understand the character of God, which are his attributes, as well as the creation of God, which are his actions, are altogether good. So God is, is, is God is. God is great. God is good. But finally, let us go on to uh, a final point that I want to make, which is God is global. And here I'm coming back to what we said earlier. In Revelation 5.9, we're given a vision of what Jesus will do. No one, that, that verse says, was found worthy to open the seals. But eventually they said, yes, the Lamb can open the seals. Why? Because with your blood, now who has he purchased? With your blood, the book says there, you have purchased for God people from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. Again, God is saying he is the God of all the nations. I want us to realize, therefore, that because of what we see here, it is impossible to have certain ideologies. And I want here to just go quickly through how Everything we've studied in Genesis totally demolishes all these other isms and ideologies and false gods that we, create, we have created for ourselves. Recognize this, my friends. Everybody worships something or someone. If you don't worship the true God, you will not worship no God. You will replace the true God with a false God. And sometimes that God is a God in your own image. Because of what we've just seen in Genesis, Atheism is out. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. How can you look at all this majesty and say there is no God? It popped out of nothing? It just came? Really? And you call yourself a scientist? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Atheism is out. Is out. Agnosticism, the guys who don't know if there's a God or not, they're kind of sitting on the fence, you know, they don't know if there's a God, is out. This is a God who declares from the beginning he is God and shows us by his works that he is God. The gods of the East, pantheism, which is God is in everything. God is in this pulpit, he's in your chairs, he's in this tent, he's in your cars. Not, not that the spirit is there, God, he's in the, in the actual engine of your car. That is out. God is the maker, but he is separate from his creation. He is not part of his creation. Polytheism, many gods, is out. God says he is a jealous God. What did we read in Zechariah? One God alone will be king. You cannot worship many gods. There's a new God that we have, and these are gods of the West. These are the gods of rationalism, the God of the mind. Your mind is not God. Your mind is a creation. And sometimes you've seen people with very beautiful minds getting it so fundamentally wrong. Humanism, man is God, is out. Man is a creature we are not gods. The Eastern mysticism, Eastern religions, which ignore matter and say everything is spirit, are out. God created matter, material. For this God, matter, matter matters. 
matter, the material matters. There's nothing wrong with matter. And the gods of the West, where they say matter is everything. This is naturalism. We want to reduce everything into its chemical parts. That is also out. Because God is spirit, the Bible says. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is global. And there's some new gods which we have created. There's a new god in the West called this. Here's the code. S B N R. I don't know if you understand what that stands for. Spiritual, but not religious. Have you got any friends like that? I do. And there's some categories, you know, when they look at the forms nowadays in the West, if they do an audit, you know, and they look at, uh, you know, wh where they fill out your religion and you say, I'm not a Muslim, or a Hindu, or a Christian. There's a whole category at the bottom called nun, N-O-N-E. And the nuns, these are not the Catholic nuns, these are the nuns, none of the above. And the spiritual but not religious is the biggest category in the West today. Now, tell me something. Spiritual but not religious. You know what they say? I pray to God directly. I've got a direct line <laughs> to God and I love Jesus. Some will even say I read my Bible, but I don't get involved in these religions. The religions of men. You create, that's the religions of men. I don't get involved. They've got their own formulation of the gospel. Here is what these people don't realize. They have made God in their own image. Such a person is simply picking and choosing for himself or herself a religion that is convenient, that suits them. They are making up their own religion. That's a definition of man-made religion. Someone said this, God made us in his image. And ever since, man has been returning the favor. We are now making God in our image. If you're spiritual but not religious, if you have such a friend, tell them this. Go and look at the mirror. Behold your God. I want then to just conclude with two major issues and two ways in which we, I think, are getting this whole idea of worshiping God wrong. Is this God that we have read about unique? Yes. Is this God also powerful? Yes. Here we are revealed, we are told about the name of God. In the Bible, in Genesis 1, and it says, in the beginning, God made, actually the word God there in Hebrew is the word Elohim, which is actually a plural form of God. It is actually, should be in English, should really translate the gods with an S. What is it talking about there? Because other places, later on in scripture, you get to know about Yahweh. But here it is Elohim. Who are the gods? Hang on a minute. We are knowing, we, we've just heard that every time God created, how did he create? He spoke. He spoke the word into, into, into existence. We know something about speaking because the New Testament t tells us something. Who was the word? The word was who? Jesus Christ. In the beginning, John 1 was the word, yeah? And the word was? With God and? God, yeah, and? Uh, nothing, uh, go on, yeah, nothing made, that was not made, yeah. And in other words, Jesus was there from the beginning, and nothing was made without him. Jesus was the word. Later down in John, what does it say? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Every time God spoke, that was actually Jesus Christ. So that shows Christ was actually there in creation. The book of Colossians, again, confirms this. But also, Genesis 1, verse um, uh, 2 says this, that the earth was void and formless, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. So hence, we have the explanation. The Elohim, the gods, are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Already we have revelation of a triune God. So, let us then compare and see whether this God compares with other gods. There are just two issues I want to look at as we close. One is, is this God the same as the God of other faiths? One big, big question people ask. Is Yahweh of the Bible the same as Allah of the Quran? And the question is not even which God is better, which God is more powerful. That is not the, the, the argument. The case is this. Is their personality the same? Let me give you an example, a very common name. If you look at a common name like, let's say, John Kamau, 
I know John Kamau, and you know John Kamau. If I want to differentiate my John Kamau from your John Kamau, what do you do? We start getting into the personality. Describe him. How does he look? What's his personality? Is he married? How many children does he have? Where does he live? What are his likes, his dislikes? You begin to describe the personality. Well, let us do the same thing with these two gods. Allah is a God who is impersonal. The Quran says he lives under a veil and does not reveal himself. Yahweh is a God who is fully revealed to us in the scripture and through Christ. Allah is a God who is at war with his enemies. Yahweh is a God who died for his enemies. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Allah is a God who works. You must work to achieve salvation. Yahweh is a God for whom you only get saved by grace and not by works, lest no one should boast. With Allah, there is no concept like original sin. So you must work with God. Our sins have separated us from his holiness, and we need another mediator who is Jesus Christ. So with Allah, there's no need for the cross because there's no concept of salvation. With Yahweh, the cross is the center of his healing and restoration for us. You answer for yourselves, are those two gods the same? You clearly see a difference in the concept of God. When we hear the word God, ask somebody, what God do you believe in? And begin to understand, is it the God we've just described now, or are you creating another God? And by the way, that's a, a, a sermon for another day, there's a fundamental difference if you do the same exercise between Jesus and the person they call Isa in the Quran. Just do the same exercise. Simple one being, Jesus died and rose for our sins. In the Quran, there's no need for sin. There's therefore no need for death on the cross. Already, it is a difference. And by the way, Allah is a strictly monotheistic God. Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is triumph. So, there's a difference. And finally, I just want to comment as we close about a disturbing trend. And this is a disturbing trend which I've seen in our churches, particularly churches from this region. There's a picture here I'm going to put up. This is very disturbing. I saw this when, when I was coming from church last Sunday. Can anybody explain to me, anybody who comes from that region, what is going on here? I see some people smiling. What is going on here? What is it about us people who are from this part of the world? We're abandoning our God and going to traditional gods. Why? Because of this idea that this is the white man's religion. Ever heard that argument? So let me ask this question. Do we as Christians worship the white man's God? Some say no. Some are not so sure. Well, let me just demolish that argument and just spend a few minutes explaining this, that we Africans have got our African fingerprints all over the Bible and also all over early Christianity and also all over the history of the church. I'll go quickly here. I'll give you a few references, but let us proceed. If we can just say, first of all this, remember, an African, an African carried Jesus' cross. His name was Simon of Cyrene. Africans were present at Pentecost. How do you know this? It says in Acts 2, when the Spirit came, there were people from Cyrene and people from Egypt. At Pentecost, there were Africans. Africans were in the first church and were the leaders of the church. Those Christians from Cyrene, it tells us after the dispersion, after Stephen was stoned in, in, in Acts chapter 8, and were, Christians were dispersed, some of them went to a place called Antioch. And they became leaders in the church in Antioch. Now, here's what happens. This is Acts chapter 11. The beginning of Acts chapter 11 tells us, tells us this. There were in Antioch leaders there, who people came from, uh, from Cyrene. Cyrene is a town in northern, uh, uh, northeastern um, uh, Libya, 
It was a very prosperous city then. So these Libyans actually went and started preaching to the Greeks in Antioch. What happened? Many of them got converted. There was such good news about the way the Spirit was blessing them. Barnabas went and got the Apostle Paul and said, come here and actually find out. See what's happening in Antioch. The Apostle Paul comes and with Barnabas and Antioch, they stayed there working with the other Christians. I want us to notice this, that the Christians in Antioch who were leaders of the church were Africans, amongst others. Where's my evidence? Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 actually names these, they were called prophets and teachers in the church, five of them. It says Paul and Barnabas, those are there. There's a Roman who you can assume was, was Italian called Manain. And then there were two other people. There was Lucius, that was the leader from Cyrene, who was a prophet and teacher, and Simon of Niger. And Niger was actually the Latin name, meaning a very dark-skinned man. Those are the five prophets and teachers in Antioch. It says something interesting in Acts 13, um, um, 4. It says this, that they now wanted to commission Paul to go out and preach. Well, Paul and Barnabas were commissioned to, be pre to, to go out and, and preach. Who laid hands on them? It's these three people. The Roman guy called Manian, the African called Simon of Niger, and the African called Lucius of Libya. Two Africans laid hands on the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. I want us to go further and understand that it was in Antioch, the Bible says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the believers were first called Christians. Well, guess who were the leaders of the church in Antioch? They included one African called Lucius and another prophet and teacher called Simon. Totally fake news to say that this is white man's religion, but that is in the Bible. Let me now come out. I don't know if you realize how influential the early church fathers were, and that in the Bible, the African church in North Africa was the center of global Christianity for the first 600 years. And Christianity moved to Ethiopia and Nubia during New Testament times and never left the continent. I emphasize, there are some names that you must get, and I want you to take a picture and remember these names, because these are people who are heroes of not the African church, but the global church of Christ. Athanasius from Alexandria in Egypt. Aurelius and Cyprian from Tunisia. Clement and Origen of Alexandria and Tertullian. Tertullian, an absolute giant of the Christian faith. These are people who protected the church from heresy, shaped doctrine, they wrote the creeds. They were instrumental in converting Europe to Christianity, not the other way round. The, 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 the Scots and the Germans and the French and the English were civilized and evangelized by the influence of African Christians. Let's get our history right. If you're to read history, let us read it honestly, not conveniently to fit the narrative. And these are people who we can therefore claim, because of this, that Christianity is indeed an indigenous African religion. Tell me something. Those of you who say that Christianity was brought here by the white man 200 years ago, why are you ignoring the fact that Africa was the host of Christianity 2,000 years ago and the Christianity has never left the continent? Who has a bigger claim to be indigenous? Someone who's been around for 2,000 years or 200 years? Let's be honest about our history. And this is what we find. These are the people who we must, we must look at. But there's one person I must tell you about because he stands in a class by himself. And his name is St. Augustine of Hippo. This man is the single most influential Christian in history after the Apostle Paul single most influential Christian, and he was an African Berber from Nigeria, uh, Algeria, an African from the Berber tribe. And go up and read about this man. This is just a few highlights. We don't even do him justice. His ideas have shaped Western political thought and Christian thought. Not just Christian thought, but political thought. Anybody doing political science or theology or philosophy cannot go through their majors without studying this man. He developed major doctrines like grace, like salvation, by grace, like free will, um, the theory of the just war, etc. He's an influencer of influences. The reformers, Calvin and Luther, 
were people who are Augustinian. Luther was himself an Augustinian monk before he became a reformer. Many popes have said they've been influenced by him. Presidents and philosophers have also read his book. He was a prolific author and preacher. Here are just some interesting quotes from this person. Look at the beauty of his theology. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek him, the greatest adventure. To find him, the greatest human achievement. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So then how do we conclude? I just want to give us, in conclusion, a quick model. I'll just be a minute on this. A quick model that we can use as we're looking at this whole question of God and culture. We must realize that this God of, of, of the Bible is a global God. He's a God who wants to save the whole world. But with any culture, when it is looking at Christianity, there are three things you must look at. And this is a model for any pre-Christian group. There are some things you must retain, which are good. Your language, your dress, your food, your festivals, your values. There are some things we can redeem. I believe our rites of passage, what we call ropes, rites of passage experiences, can be redeemed as we take our young boys and girls, but teaching them the values, the boys may go through the cut, the girls know, but you're teaching them values as they go through different life stages. But my friends, there are things we must reject. Rituals. All those rituals we do during the funerals. Guys, let's spare us the drama during funerals. What are you Christians doing? Slaughtering bulls facing the east and then sprinkling the blood. What is it that we're doing? Spare us the drama and let us be true Christians. Blood sacrifice, my friends, be very careful about dabbling with blood sacrifice. It is a legitimate way of covenanting with evil spirits. You're giving evil spirits ritual um, access and legal access into your lives. Libations and calling for spirits. And by the way, the covenants, there's this thing about joining the Kiyama. I don't know how many of you men have, uh, have joined Kiyama, eh? but I've been invited two times and I've refused. And I'll tell you my reasons. The Kiyama, what happens is that first of all, you sa sa sacrifice a goat. I don't believe a goat should be sacrificed because Christ the perfect lamb has already been sacrificed. When you join the Kiyama, you also join a covenant and I've already made my covenant with Christ. When I join the Kiyama, I stand in line in succession to become a high priest. Christ is already my high priest. And he's a perfect high priest who does not need to make sacrifice for himself because he is perfect. He does not need to repeat that high priest sacrifices for himself. Christ does not sacrifice for Read Hebrews. He is the perfect high priest who once and for all made the perfect sacrifice on the cross. You can't double in both. And then finally, my friends, we must stop wearing protective charms. Some of you guys see amazing things in the gym eh, when you're changing. <laughs> you look at those things people are wondering, and also some body cuttings, and you wonder, where is it, what is this from? Do you want the protection of charms or the protection that Christ bought on the cross? That he defeated every spirit on the cross. And we should stop, my friends, go and worshiping mountains. What are you doing worshiping a mountain? Do you worship the mountain, the God who lives in the mountain, or the God who made the mountain? The Bible says that the mountains melt before God like wax and the hills tremble and shake. Which God are you going to worship? So my friends, let us then, I end with the words of Joshua. Choose you this day whom you will worship. Is it the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the river? or the gods of this modern land of the Amorites. If it be too hard for you to choose, you decide. And then Joshua ended in these famous words. But as for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. Let us stand up and pray. Amen. Father, I just bring us before you. I pray that, Father, you who is almighty, you who is the sovereign God, maker of heaven and earth, would truly be God in our lives. Father, I repent on behalf of any of us who have covenanted with false gods, people who have made sacrifices. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, 
We break any covenant. We break any covenant. Anything that has been done, any alliance made with the evil one through these false gods. Father, I pray that you'd refresh us and renew us by your blood. Father, I pray that you'd help us not to make you in our image, but to follow you as Redeemer and Savior. And Father, I pray that your mighty blessing, you who is the God who sees the end from the beginning, would go with us. I pray for the blessing of God the Father in each and every one of us. I pray for the mighty blessing of God the Son, who sacrificed on the cross, atoned for all our sin. And I pray for the blessing of God the Spirit, who perfects us and teaches us the truth of Christ. Go in peace, and may God bless you and be with you through the rest of the week. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.